You're listening to the Common Descent Podcast. Hello, Will. Hello, David. Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode 125 of the Common Descent Podcast. Wait, ends in a five? It ends in a five, which means it's a plant episode. Woohoo! This time we're talking about orchids. Orchids. Orchids, a very popular and prominent and widespread group of plants that Will and I don't know anything about. No, as far as I know, they are pretty flower plants. They're, they're, I assume they're weird. Yep. Lots of people wanted us to talk about them. So after the break, after the news, we'll be joined by Allie to talk about orchids. Yeah. We will talk about what orchids are, what makes them unique, what we know of their evolutionary history and fossil record, which, spoilers, not much. (laughs) And basically, you'll get to hear Allie teach us all about orchids. And hopefully you learn as enthusiastically as we do. Yeah. We'll do this episode because orchids are a fascinating group of plants, because it's an opportunity to talk with our friend Dr. Allie Baumgartner, and because it was requested. Oh, yeah. As with all our episodes, this topic, in particular, was requested by Mark, Jesse, Ed, Jonathan, and Serpentine. Bunch of orchid fans. Lots of orchid fans. Thanks, everyone, for the suggestion. But before we get into the main episode, a little bit of announcements. Thing number one, we have a Patreon. We do. Our Patreon supplies us with lots of funds to do lots of things, including everything we do for the podcast. All of it. So a huge thanks, as always, to our patrons. And one of the things you get on Patreon, if you join us at a certain level, is that we'll say your name right here on the podcast. So this episode, we would like to welcome our new patrons at that level, Luton, Michael, Joseph, and Sal. Welcome and thank you, everyone. Thank you and welcome. Hey, if you join us on Patreon, not only can you support us in our science communication efforts, but you get goodies. Yeah. We do director's notes for each episode. We do bonus uh, content, like bonus news. And indeed, for any patrons that missed it, we've already announced this on the Patreon, but we are doing a patron live stream coming up in early November. So if you are a patron, keep your eyes and ears out. For that, that'll be fun. We'll get to chat directly with some of our patrons, share some thoughts, answer some questions, maybe maybe make a few announcements. Yeah, I'm I'm looking forward to it. Things like that. And hey, if people like it, maybe we'll keep doing more stuff like that. So be sure to chime in and make your voices heard. Speaking of making your voices heard, as always, people can reach out to us on Patreon or our social medias or our email. And also these days, physically, with a physical mail. Uh, We recently got another card From a patron of ours, Elizabeth. A lovely Halloween card. Thanks, Elizabeth. With some neat glow-in-the-dark stickers. Ah, so if you would like to send us some mail, check the episode description for our physical address, which you can also find on our blog and on our YouTube description and places like that. This episode releases on Halloween... Convenient. Which I think is the first time that's happened on the podcast. We're not... The orchids are not particularly spooky. Spooky orchids. (laughs) But... This does come at the end of a a month filled with plants and with our friend Allie. Yes. (laughs) Who joined us for this year's Spook E. If you missed it, we have released, by the time this episode comes out, we we will have released all four episodes of 2021's Spookulative Evolution. This year's theme, Monster Plants. It was a lot of fun. A lot of fun. We covered four different categories of monster plants with our friend Allie, created some really cool spooky monster creatures. So give that a listen. And now that Spooky is out of the way, we can go ahead and make a brief reminder to everyone that our next bonus thing is coming up. In November, we will be putting up the 2021 end-of-the-year Q&A submission form. (laughs) Every year, we like to do an end-of-the-year Q&A, which is just a few hours of us answering questions submitted by our listeners, which you can submit via the form that will go up in mid-November. So stay tuned for more information about that form when it goes up. Well, with that... It's time for the news. News! Every episode before we get to our main topic of discussion, in this case orchids, we like to cover some news. News from the world of paleontology and evolution and earth history, the kinds of things we like to cover on the podcast. Will, would you like to present us with some news? Happily. 
I have some news on some research, a detailed study of what very likely may be the earliest gliding vertebrates. Oh, very cool. This is research by Adam Pritchard et al. in Pier J. And the article we'll be linking to in the blog post, because we have one of those. We sure do. Every episode. Is by Tess Josie in Smithsonian Magazine. This research is on a group of reptiles known as the Weigel Tesoridae. This is a early group of diapsid small reptiles known from the upper Permian. Ooh. And are known for having slimmer, slender frames, you know, slender bodies, slender limbs, a crested head with like kind of a, a frill that had horny project projections on it. And long bones coming off of the ribs that may have supported a patagium. Right. So these would have looked, they weren't lizards, but they would have probably looked a lot like lizards mm -hmm. with flaps off the sides. Yes. So like gliding lizards today. Yeah, like the Draco lizard today. <laughs> this research is specifically on Weigeltosaurus jacoli. Now these are known from a number of places around the world, England, Germany, Madagascar, and Russia, but they haven't been described in detail very much. So even though they are a known group and they've been known for a while, this is one of the few really detailed studies of their anatomy, particularly on one specimen that was a very complete specimen. But the specimen is not positioned ideally. So that's part of the reason that detailed research hadn't happened right away. It's curved over on itself, kind of hunched. Mm. Uh, from the picture, it kind of looked like a fetal position. Yeah. Like it's curled up. And a bunch of bones are overlapping and overlaid. Right. Which makes it hard to study from the surface. I bet they CT scanned it. They didn't in this one. Oh. No. Well. This was a much more... Uh, yeah, X-ray uh, vision. Yeah, right? <laughs> <laughs> this was a much more old school analysis, uh, which was pretty interesting. Now, previously, it's this is not the first paper to suggest that these were gliding reptiles. Uh, those long bones that seem to come off the sides of the body sure do seem like they would be good for gliding wing-like structures, mm -hmm. but it's been hard to confirm because of the positioning of the fossil. To get a better idea of the anatomy of this fossil, they went to this particular specimen, the best specimen for the anatomy, uh, which I believe was discovered in 1992. This fossil was housed at the State Museum of Natural History in Germany, and so they went there and basically just took detailed notes, pictures, and measurements. Okay. And just got as much information as they could before coming back to the Smithsonian to do to finish the you know research and uh, uh, publication and from that made an interpretation of how it would look as a laid out skeleton and so a mu like a much more old school hands on approach than yeah, yeah. CT scanning. Uh, not that CT scanning isn't hands-on. No, but like... But this is the low-tech... Yes, that's what I meant. Yes, <laughs> thank you. Right. You're not using uh, technological superpowers. And they found some interesting things. One, that the long bones that would support the patagium were separate from the skeleton. They were not projections of the ribs. Mm -hmm. They were separate from them. Separate elements, which they said is a singular trait this is not known in any of the gliding lizards that have similar wings today. Mm -hmm. So this is unique to them. This makes them pretty confident that it was a glider. It sure does seem like one. And they were also able to map out or attempted to map out where this would fit among reptiles. You know, on the reptile family tree, just comparing its anatomy to other ancient lizards and modern groups. They said superficially you could probably picture it kind of looking like a chameleon uh, okay. when it was actually alive and moving around, but that it split from all the modern groups of reptiles, of lizards, snakes, crocs, at least long ago. So it is a separate line from all of them. It's not, it's lizard-esque, but definitely not even closely related, it sounds like. Yeah. But they're hoping that with future research of this group, we will get insights into early reptile evolution, and early gliding. Yeah, it's really interesting that there was this time period from the Permian to the Triassic where reptiles were doing lots of experimentation with gliding. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That you have several different groups that achieved gliding. Some like this one, and I had heard of groups that had, and I, mean, I might be thinking of just this group, extra bones just to support the, quote, wing flaps. Yep. While others use the ribs, mm -hmm. which I think is what 
like modern gliding lizards, like Draco lizards do. I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty sure those Think are the ribs. So. That's also kind of how gliding snakes do it. Yep, yep, yep. They don't have like a flat separately, but they flatten their body and spread out their ribs. And then you've got wacky ones like Charo Victorix, yeah. which is the Delta glider. Which is just, that's so weird. So it's really cool to get more insights into the earliest branching and appearing of these gliders to see what different experiments were attempted, right? Or, or in this case, were done, yeah. right? succeeded, <laughs> at least for a little bit. And what made them different and why was gliding so common and why did it show up in so many different ways? And different from the way mammals do it. Yes. Because like a gliding squirrel, it's just between the limbs. Yeah, they're using their it's a limbs wingsuit to do it. Yeah. Yeah, it's when it's also fascinating convergent evolution to me. Yeah, it is. Uh, like, because the, they don't have a, an artistic reconstruction, at least in the, the article, but they have a picture of the skeleton. It looks like a weird Draco lizard. Yeah. Like, that's it looks very lizard-esque, and then it has wings, long wings instead of the rounded wings that Draco has, but wings coming off the, tor- you know, the midsection of the body. That just looks like, an exo- like a, a fancy Draco yeah. lizard. And it kind of is. Which is neat. Yeah. Well, hey, since you've got news about an early example of a cool thing, I also have news about an early example of a cool thing. Copycat. In this case, let's take it up with the researchers. (laughs) What might be the earliest uh, known example of dinosaur social behavior? Ooh. Yeah. This is research by Diego Pohl et al. in Scientific Reports. And in the blog post, we will link to an article by Michael Greshko in National Geographic, Dinosaur Social Behavior. Over the years, paleontologists have learned a lot about dinosaur social behavior from many different sources of evidence. Uh, We did a whole episode, episode 61, about behavior in the fossil record, and we talked a lot about examples of dinosaur social behavior. But these authors note most of the evidence we have of dinosaur social behavior, things like herding or group living or group interactions comes from the Cretaceous period. Which is what I would have guessed if you made me. Which means that we don't have a lot of evidence for earlier dinosaurs. This particular research is about ancestors of sauropods, the long neck dinosaurs that we did episode 101 about. In particular, we have evidence of herding in sauropods from the Cretaceous, even from the late Jurassic, but not a lot of detailed evidence from earlier than that. This research looks at a fossil assemblage from the early Jurassic in Argentina, an assemblage of a sauropodomorph, so not a true sauropod, but the ancestral group from which sauropods evolved, named Musaurus, whose name, uh, Moose from Mouse. Oh. Because they were tiny, or at least the first ones discovered were very tiny, because I'm pretty sure they were babies. Cute. This site is a massive fossil assemblage. Uh, This study reports the scale of this assemblage as including over 100 eggs and around 80 skeletons of many different ages, including several embryos inside of eggs. Awesome. Just a huge collection, all different ages, all within a, a roughly one square kilometer of each other and within a few different, uh, just a handful of layers of sediment, which seems to imply that they are associated. Researchers have been excavating this site for about two decades and doing research on it in that time. Previous research has revealed information about these animals' eggs, about how they grew over time. This has been a good source of mining information about sauropodomorphs. This study is specifically examining the association of all these fossils. Is this an example of groups being buried together because they were living together. The study finds that many of the fossils are within the same rock layer, which suggests that they stayed and uh, were buried there at a very similar time. It also notes that one particular cluster of skeletons discovered in 2003, there are about 11 skeletons, and here they examine them and show that they are all about the same size, and based on their bone tissue, looks like they're about the same age, under a year old, which seems to be a little congregation of similarly aged individuals. And nursery. Altogether, this seems to be evidence for a lot of things. 
Number one, colonial nesting. Lots of eggs and moving around born and alive individuals. Also potentially herding with so many individuals in one place and potentially age segregation within the group that you've got a bunch of young ones of roughly the same age clustering together. All makes sense. This appears to be, and they interpret it as, evidence of complex social behavior. By returning to the same place, nesting in the same place, nesting as a group, uh, living as a group. And in that case, this would be the oldest evidence of complex social behavior, not just in the sauropod lineage, but in dinosaurs. Awesome. As they put it, predating other complex social behavior evidence by more than 40 million years. Wow. Yeah. This paper actually also refines the date of the site. Previously estimated at just over 200 million years ago, here they do zircon dating, a uranium-lead series zircon dating, to put it at 193 million years old, the oldest potential evidence of complex social behavior in dinosaurs. I find this neat because a lot of these social behaviors that we're seeing are similar to sauropods, you know, things we've seen in other groups, which makes sense. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it's also neat to know that it is something that I don't know if this is enough to say it could be ancestral, but that ancestral groups also seem to have been doing it. Right. It goes back a long ways. Yeah. And that's fascinating. It's also one of those that brings to mind for me that, yeah, I assume early dinosaurs were also being social. We just probably don't have good fossils for it. Yeah. So it's exciting to get older examples. And indeed, this research uh, might even indicate that it wasn't just something they were doing, but that it was important that they were doing it. Because that refined dating, bumping it down about 10 million years, moves this site from the late Triassic to the early Jurassic. Which puts the age of this site at just after the Triassic-Jurassic extinction event, which wiped out lots of Triassic groups, and is the extinction that sort of set the stage for sauropods and other dinosaurs to expand. Episode 15. So the authors also note, since we have this evidence of group living sauropodomorphs just after this event, was colonial and group social behavior a factor that made it easier for dinosaurs to survive? Yeah, it's this part of their success strategy. Yeah. Oh. And there was a cool little note in the article about the trade-off of group living. So the positives of group living is that it mostly it's protection. Yeah, it's yeah. safety in numbers. Safety in numbers. You can protect your eggs working together. You can protect your young. You can protect each other. You can eat knowing that a few of them are keeping a lookout yeah, and all that. More eyes mean more chances someone's going to scream before you get eaten. Yes. But there are downsides. Uh, one is you have to share food. It's harder to feed a herd than it is to feed an individual. And also, uh, one uh, that they pointed out, higher risk of diseases and parasites. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, when you're in a group, it's competition now. You're Mm -hmm. living on top of each other, but also, large groups spread diseases really well. Yeah, they sure do, don't they? Yeah. (laughs) That's something to be mindful of, I feel. Yeah. I don't even have a clever response to that. (laughs) It's just depressing. (laughs) (laughs) That's how much I hate that. (laughs) So yeah, this is early evidence for complex social behavior and possibly also a, certainly not proof, but a little uh, reminder that this could also be one of the reasons for the success of some groups of dinosaurs. Which is is a neat concept. It's, I feel like it's often easy to just assume that, you know, uh, uh, big successful groups, you know, will have social behavior, but that it doesn't often get discussed whether or not that's why they became successful right like that could be one of the reasons they're doing well like herding animals are so common maybe because they herd yeah that could very well be a a boon to them fascinating yeah well i don't have a segue but my next news is about a crab and amber well hey that's a segue enough for me (laughs) this is a very, very well-preserved crab. Very modern-looking crab from Cretaceous Amber. Ooh. This is research by Javier Luque et al. in Science Advances. Uh, and the article seemed to be a press release from Sci News. So this is the first record of crabs in amber. 
very cool. Which, yeah. Which also, like, yeah, I saw crabs and amber and I went, huh. Yeah. What are you doing in there? Weird. This is Cretaceous Myanmar amber, so right around 100 million years old. Now, quick aside, we've mentioned this in previous newses. Myanmar or Burmese amber, while great for fossils and research, is tied up in a lot of controversy in the past, but especially these days, mm-hmm. uh, with the, the selling and mining of this amber funding some really, really horrible practices and acts. So there, there is some controversy, not some, but some notable controversy around this amber. Yeah. Cool fossil discoveries that we want to be able to talk about, but also we should mention that, yeah, that there is a whole ethical minefield yeah around this subject uh, many people debating as to whether we should forego research for the for the foreseeable bit while this controversy is is in its heights indeed but this crab is part of it seems to be true crabs you you brachyura right. as we discussed in episode 117 so this is a crab crab not just a crab looking thing right not just a thing called a crab that's not really a crab yes this is a crab, and it looks a lot like today's crabs, which is not typical from what the article said of a mini Cretaceous crabs. This crab is very well preserved. It preserves its compound eyes, delicate mouth parts, and even its gills. Cool. Uh, one of the quotes in the article from one of the researchers said, it's not missing a hair. Like, it's not missing any <laughs> part. It is the whole crab. Now, whilst it is in true crabs and looks modern looking, it is not a modern group of crabs, it doesn't sound like. They said it superficially resembles a lot of shore crabs okay. today. You know, so if you picture those little crabs that would be running around the beach, that's the kind of crab we're talking about. And the fact that it is in amber is interesting being a crab, but also that it had well-developed gills. So this was not a fully terrestrial crab, which means it was likely semi-aquatic going in and out of the water coming onto land and to be trapped in amber likely was in a forested area because that's where trees are and that's where amber comes from right episode 62 (laughs) i was wondering i was like how does a crab end up in amber Mm -hmm. was it crawling on the branches was it in amongst the roots was it in a log or something like that well and this is part of why most likely it was in a brackish or freshwater environment Yeah, makes sense. Not at the beach, but inland. Mm -hmm. Which gives us some interesting insights into the emergence of non-marine crabs. Ooh. The earliest record, fossil record, of non-marine crabs is about somewhere between 75 and 50 million years old. That's the first fossil evidence of brackish or freshwater crabs. But molecular data indicates that they likely diverged around 130 million years old. This falls nicely smack dab in the middle of that, yep. filling in part of that gap, supporting that, yeah, no, it does seem that they showed up earlier than the fossils we had up till now. It doesn't quite reach back as far as we think they might have first diverged, but this is a nice bit of info in between that gap. And it is also very nice because typically non-marine crabs do not have a good fossil record. Uh, they don't preserve well in like full crab fossils, but bits and pieces typically. So just a very nice crab from an interesting place, preserved in an interesting way for a useful time. We've talked about a lot of cool stuff in Amber before. And again, episode 62, we did a whole episode about it. It must be really cool to be looking at Amber and see something you might not have expected to see in Amber. Yes. Like insects is like, all right, yeah, an insect in Amber. Everyone's got an insect in Amber. Yeah, That's kind of Amber's thing. That's its whole shtick. But a crab is a really cool find. And it reinforces that utility of amber as a source of information you don't otherwise get. It's just such a really fascinating, useful resource, which is why it's, you know, amber is relatively rare. There are only a handful of places that are really rich sources of amber. And so it's a really, it's a very important resource and an important resource to take good care of, which is another reason why there's controversy around Burmese amber. A case where amber is not being handled in a particularly good way, which is a real shame in addition to human rights issues. Yes. Also for research and science issues about the potential scientific value yeah. of amber deposits. Yeah, it, it is very much a multi-layered controversy. Yeah. 
There is one really neat thing in the article that will be linked. Uh, they have a nice animation that shows the crab in amber and then brings a 3D model of it out and then animates it walking around. Oh, cool. Just one transition. And it really emphasizes like, yeah, it's the crab. The it's, whole crab. It's not missing any bits. It's not distorted. Yeah, it's, the crab, the whole crab, and nothing but the crab. It's so cool. And it, it's just so cute. Yeah. <laughs> that's It's a really cool fossil. <laughs> well, hey, I've got one last bit of news. And we've done that thing that we do sometimes that for me, I this always makes me very happy. We didn't do this on purpose. That our discoveries are in chronological order. <laughs> that we went from the Permian to the Triassic to the Cretaceous. And this is a study that mostly regards the Cenozoic. And I just, I, it just, it's very satisfying <laughs> to me because that's the kind of dork that I am. <laughs> this is research about snakes. Be happy. Uh, uh, whoa. Sna- yeah, that's darn right. Oh, to, to boy. Turn this podcast around. Silver medal. This. <laughs> uh, 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 say goodbye to Will, everybody. <laughs> this is his last episode. Yep, yep. Well, we made it 125, 125 episodes 125, the team. That was it. This is research about the evolutionary history of snake dietary adaptations. Oh. Cool stuff. This is research by Michael Grundler and Daniel Raboski in the journal PLOS. And we will link to a press release in phys.org via the University of Michigan. This research focuses on examining the diversification, so the evolutionary diversity and radiation and patterns over time, following the Cretaceous into modern times. Now, if this sounds very familiar, it is because we did a we covered a news very similar to this back in episode 123 about spiders. That news used DNA to estimate the diversification of species of snakes after the end Cretaceous extinction, found that most modern snake groups originated after the extinction, and we also saw a diversity in their anatomy diversity, a a, a radiation in morphological diversity. Many more shapes of snakes showed up after the extinction. As mentioned in that news, we don't know a lot about early snake diversification, as compared to things like birds or mammals. This new research does something very similar, but instead of looking at the relatedness of snakes and their morphology, it looks at diets over time. To do this, they combined snake evolutionary trees with information on snake diets today. Ooh. So they collected info from a data set of snake diets, including observations, so people who observed and recorded what snakes were eating. (laughs) That snake sure did eat that thing. It ate the thing. I found it doing it right there. And stomach contents. Nice. From museum specimens and other cases. Totaling over 34,000 cases of snake dietary observations, including 882 species of snakes. Wow. So a huge data set of what snakes eat. That's awesome. Then they mapped this diversity of diets onto an evolutionary tree of snakes to estimate how those diet how this dietary diversity has come to be over time creating a model to predict when certain dietary adaptations showed up in the history of snake evolution neat and what they found is that most early snakes in the cretaceous period were likely specialized in eating insects or lizards, or similar things to that. You know, a lot of small snakes, early snakes, focusing on small prey. But they found a rapid increase in diet diversity after the end of the Cretaceous, after the uh, Cretaceous mass extinction, into the Cenozoic, especially in the Eocene. Mm. So starting, you know, 10, 15 million years after the end Cretaceous. Around this time, they estimate we start to see snake diets expanding into things like mammals and birds, which themselves were expanding during this time period. That's what I was expecting. And also, we start to see specialists in things like snails and slugs, eggs, etc. It is not entirely surprising to see a diversification after a mass extinction event, because that, A, frees up ecological space, right? Competition is lowered, so now you can expand. And also, as we just mentioned, if a bunch of new prey is doing really well, you can go eat them. Also, if you were starting out as a relatively small group, small 
you know, bodied group, if you have mass extinction, that might get rid of some of your predators. Yeah, and then if you grow, mm-hmm. uh, insects aren't going to do it anymore for you. Yeah. <laughs> and it, as it happens, there's all these f- fuzzy things running around. Bigger mouth means more opportunities. <laughs> yeah, that's true. So they do see potential diversification in response to sort of new eco- ecological shifts. But also they note a similar expansion in ecology in snakes after they make it over to the New World. No. Oh. So when certain groups of snakes make it to the Americas for the first time, uh, in the tropics and also in the temperate regions, we see similar expansions in their dietary diversity. That they made it to a new continent or pair of continents and had all sorts of new opportunities to exploit. Cool. This is one of those interesting researches where I know snakes were not always the way they are today. Yeah. And that they had to be less diverse at some point. Uh, But that's still one of those weird things of thinking of them getting to a place or them developing a feeding strategy. Because just nowadays, it's we are a world of snakes. (laughs) Well, it's like in episode 38 when we talked about grasslands expanding and how utterly bizarre it is from a modern day perspective to imagine a world where grass wasn't everywhere. Yes. It's just every, yeah. Snakes live everywhere and they eat everything. That's just how the world is. Yes. That's just the reality we live in. Yeah. It's like picturing a world without birds. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. There, there, yeah. There are just birds. That's what earth is like. No, there are birds on it. That's what's in the air. <laughs> yeah. That's what the air is full of. Yes. That's what the air is for <laughs> is bird. Yeah. It's, it's a weird concept thinking of uh, truly picturing snake diversification just because it is such a staple of our lives today that it, it's a, it's a cool topic to really ponder. Yeah. One thing that I liked about this research is that the authors point out that this is in many ways a starting point kind of research, partially because, uh, as they noted, the 882 species represented in this study are less than a quarter of living snake species. Yeah. I, <laughs> yeah. It, it's a great sample, but as we were just saying... <laughs> It's a lot of snakes. <laughs> For any other group. <laughs> right, yeah, 882 would be, yeah, well, you're Whoa. knocking out of the park. 882 horse species, you say. <laughs> they also note that about half the species that they included only have dietary observations uh, numbering 12 or fewer. Yeah. So we don't have a lot of dietary info on a lot of these. The solution to which is just make more observations and learn more about snakes. They also note that here they're doing this sort of diet phylogeny comparison estimation over time with snakes, but arguably you could do this for lots of different groups, Mm -hmm. right? Combining their behavior today with their evolutionary relationships and history to create a model that predicts when those habits showed up or became common and popular. And this study is really cool because it gives us answers that are totally expected. Mm -hmm, Yeah, mm -hmm. When uh, the ecology fell apart, you rebounded and diversified. When you made it to a new place, you diversified and expanded. That makes total sense, which makes it seem like this could be a really cool avenue to explore more of these questions in many groups into the future. Well, and the other thing I really like about this research is because my first thought when you were like, this is looking at the evolutionary history of snake diets is part of me went are they just using the snake skulls we're able to find rarely right because so often when you talk about diets you're having to look at the shape of teeth and jaws that an animal is using to eat which i'm sure i don't know how much research is i'm sure there's been research on that but i've not heard much of on, on it but like you should be able to use that on snakes i assume different snake faces are good for different preys yeah But we don't get fossil snake faces very often. No. And snakes are not often highly specialized in their teeth and jaws the way that we expect in something like mammals. Exactly. Like their teeth are not built for this fine-tuned meshing together. They're good for grabbing and holding. And then you get a couple of weird ones every now and then with like saw teeth for taking on snails and stuff. And there are inferences you can make. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it's often not very specific. So 
I like this because it's a way to kind of circumvent that lack in the fossil record, but also lack in specialization. You know, Mm -hmm. if you aren't able to get that information the traditional way, this could this could be useful for other groups that fall into that kind of category. Uh, General, you know, animals that might have very generalist dentition. This could be a useful way to try to bridge that gap. I like it. Yeah, I'd like to see this thing this done with a with a group like bats. Oh yeah, right. Something else that is very diverse and has a diverse dietary. Because like you could do this with crocs, but there's only so many living species and there's only so much variation in their diet. Well, I was gonna say there's like, also only it so seems much like specialization. Yeah, it seems like the answer is crocs have eaten whatever they wanted. Yep. for as long as there have been crocs, <laughs> <laughs> whatever's in front of me when I'm hungry. Right, <laughs> whatever's in my mouth. <laughs> well, it's been a it's been a bunch of cool news. But we also have a cool discussion to be had. So we're going to take a short break. And after the break, we will be joined by our special guest and our friend and colleague, Dr. Ali Baumgartner, who's going to talk to us all about the modern diversity, evolutionary history, answers and mysteries about orchids. Stay tuned. Hello, Allie. Hello. Boy, long time no see, huh? <laughs> it, I, yeah, it's been like weeks. <laughs> it has been a month full of Allie. It is October uh, when this episode is being recorded. And when it comes out, this episode comes out on Halloween. Woo! Yes. I've... And it is the same month in which we have released several episodes of Spookulative Evolution with you, Allie. I, hold on, hold on. I have a question. Up until the month of October, how many episodes have I done? Because I'm pretty sure I might have done more in the month of October than I have leading up to the month of October. There will be five of me. (laughs) You did grass, flowers, trees, rainforest collapse, carnivorous plants, biomes. Yes. That's six. Oh, man. And you made a brief appearance at the end of, I think it was the Permian Extinction episode, episode 45. So you have almost half of the episodes you have been in have been this month. <laughs> Correct. Oh, wow. It's like when you look at those Google searches, like of <laughs> most recently searched terms. And it's yes. just, we hit October and alley. Yep. Yes. yes, yes, yes. Well, we are wrapping up the month with an alley episode named, of course, for the fact that you're in them. Th- this uh, is they're true. not actually alley episodes. They're plant episodes, but it's the same thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and you are here this time to talk with us about today's main topic, orchids. Orchids. Yes, I'm so excited. I, it's actually been really hard for me to like not spill the beans and like start spouting off orchid fun facts before we started recording. Cause like, y'all, I got so many. Oh yeah. We're going to, we're going to fill the whole episode with them. Yes. Well, I mean, without any, there's no other ado necessary. People know who you are. Let's jump into orchids, and I'm going to start by asking the question that I often start these episodes by asking, what's an orchid? Okay, so to preface everything that's about to happen, I'm actually going to have to explain some anatomical terms this time, because it's going to get a little bit technical because they're complicated. All right, so (laughs) (laughs) broadly speaking, what makes an orchid an orchid is almost exclusively in the flowers. Like the characters that are the most orchidy characters are honestly, yeah, in some way or another, all related to the flowers. So they have bilaterally symmetrical flowers, meaning that if you were to cut it in half, the right and left sides uh, would be identical, mostly. They have what's called a resupinate flower, which I'm not going to explain yet. Okay. I'm gonna, you know, just sprinkle that that in. They have a highly modified petal called a labellum that I'm going to explain later. <laughs> Great. <laughs> uh, they have fused stamens and carpels, which are the reproductive parts of the flower, and extremely small seeds, like microscopic seeds. Those are the main things that make an orchid. I didn't know there was such thing as such small seeds. Oh, they're like, and we'll get into that later, why it matters. (laughs) 
Now, we're going to talk a bit more about orchids and orchid diversity in a bit, but I would imagine that to our listeners, if they're familiar with orchids, they probably know them from, like, cultivation. Like, orchids are very common. Oh, yeah. Plants, like, have around. Yes, like, you know what an orchid is. So, um, fun fact, this is something I legitimately did not know until I started looking this up. Orchids are cam photosynthesizers. Oh, like grass. No, cam is succulents. Those, that's the desert plants. Yeah, this is the truly gotcha. weird one. So brief overview, super brief overview of types of photosynthesis. C3 photosynthesis is like the normal kind. You open your stomata, you bring in CO2, you try not to release the water, you, you get sunlight, it's great. You make sugar, go team. C4, they add another step, Crants anatomy so that they don't lose water when they're trying to bring in CO2. Cam plants, instead of uh, separating the steps in space, they separate them in time. And so they are the ones that open their stomata at night and then let in all of the CO2 and then close them during the day, get all of that sweet, sweet oxygen. By oxygen, I totally mean sunlight. Right. And then do the (laughs) photosynthesis that way. Weird. Right? Weirdos. I love them. So I'm going to broadly go over, I'm basically going to go through the parts of the plant from the bottom to the top to just kind of describe what an orchid looks like so that we can paint a mental picture and get a sense of like why these things are so, so cool. So there are two main growth patterns, monopodial and sympodial, basically is does it grow up and get really, really long? That's monopodial. Stem grows from a single bud. Leaves are added at the apex every year and they can get super long. So like vanilla, which is an orchid, um, they grow like that. There's also sympodial orchids, which they have a front and a back. (laughs) So they basically (laughs) just keep adding on the front uh, and they grow laterally instead of up. We'll have to find a picture of this because I, for the life of me, do not have a good way of explaining it other than they're wide. They grow, basically, each each stalk will grow to a certain point and die off, and then the one next to it will grow and then die off, and the one next to it will grow and die off, and the one next to it will grow and die off. Sympodial huh. uh, growth is kind of weird looking. Like long-term photosynthesizing dominoes. <laughs> yeah, kind of. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, because the, the monopodial is what I always think of when I think of an orchid is that that it's like a like a street light with a with flowers on the end. Yes. <laughs> yeah, that's monopodial. Uh, the, the sympodial are a little bit different. I It seems like most of the cultivated ones, the most of the ones that people know tend to be the monopodial, but sympodial exists. There are broadly three types there's epiphytic so those are the ones that are living on somebody else they are living on top of another plant um they have modified aerial roots so that they can basically they just got their roots hanging out in the air um to get moisture that way they can get up to a few meters long wow right just chilling and then you have lithophytic which are not living in soil they're living on rocks that would have been my guess. Right? Huh. They're they're tough guys. Uh, and then you have the your standard run-of-the-mill terrestrial orchids. Sometimes they will have rhizomes. So those are the underground stems like ginger. Ginger is a rhizome. Uh, or they'll form tubers like a potato or a pseudotuber, which is like a potato, but not a true potato. It already sounds like orchids are extremely diverse. Oh, you don't even know. I literally don't. (laughs) (laughs) I cannot. I, the part where I tell you how diverse they are is I have been looking forward to that for like a week. (laughs) Can't wait. Because they're monocots, we'll talk about that a little bit. They all, they generally have big leaves, parallel veins. Uh, They tend to be evergreen. So they hold on their leaves for a few different years. The structure of the leaf is very closely tied to their environment. So orchids that are living in full sun or dry habitats tend to have like thick leathery leathery leaves with a thick waxy cuticle, which makes sense. They're trying to keep all that moisture in. Shady species tend to have long thin leaves because again, they don't need to worry about keeping in that moisture. They're trying to get as much light as they can. 
there are so many weird ways that orchids try to be orchids. There, I'm not even going to try to tell you the scientific names for these. I will tell you the common names for these. The ghost orchid, the pauper orchid, and ribbon roots are three examples of orchids that lack leaves entirely. Huh. They, they wrap their, their roots around the roots of mature trees, and they use mycorrhiza to basically harvest sugars from the mycorrhiza of the tree. So... Everyone, like everywhere I was looking, some people call them saprophytes, which would be a parasitic plant. Some said they were specifically not saprophytes because of the way that they were getting the sugars. But regardless, my my mycorrhiza, my microbes are taking them from your microbes. So I don't quite understand the distinction. It's a leech orchid. Oh, yeah. Weird. Okay. One of the weirdest orchids I found out about is uh, Rhizanthella slateri. It is called the Eastern Underground Orchid. It is endemic to New South Wales, Australia. It is small, white, and leafless. It like, it's truly itty bitty. So a lot of the measurements for lengths were in like millimeters. (laughs) And it lives almost completely underground, rarely producing flowers. When they do, it'll be a few millimeters above the ground. That's basically the only time it ever goes above the ground. They grow in leaf litter of the forest and are pollinated by ants and other insects. So it's wow. like a mushroom. <laughs> kind of, yeah! That just lives underground and then every now and then I come up when it's time to spread more of me. Yeah, so they basically use their mycorrhiza, they use this relationship with fungi, uh, with microbes to get the nutrients that they need from the soil. They don't photosynthesize and yeah, it's only because... The pollinator I need is above the ground. That is the only reason why they ever go above the ground. Wow, what a strange plant. Right? Yeah. It's like, it's trying not to be a plant. Oh my goodness. You're doing its best fungus impression. <laughs> yeah, right? Like, but really though. Like, orchids yeah. really, like, there'll be more examples. Orchids truly want to be mushrooms. Like, very badly. <laughs> So the flowers tend to be racemose. That means that they are on a stalk. So sometimes it's one on a stalk. Sometimes it'll be many on a stalk. But yeah, they tend to have a racemose inflorescence. So they can have a basal flowering stem. So if you have the leaves at the base, the stem comes out of the base that makes the flowers. Apical, so it's from the top of the plant and then the flowers come off. Or axillary, which is, as I put it in my notes, the leaf armpit. (laughs) <laughs> so it just, it'll kind of come off the side instead of being the top or the bottom so because they're monocots which i'll talk about a little bit more in a in a second everything is divisible by three so the outer part of the flower are three whorls of sepals which are basically the part that protects the petals then you have an inner whorl of three petals you can't always tell the difference between sepals and uh petals and then we call them tepals <laughs> okay, so that's the broad, like broadly speaking, that is an orchid flower, but that is a gross oversimplification. So I'm going to explain one of the important factors that I talked about earlier, the labellum. So, okay, imagine, if you will, a flower with three petals. Got it. So you you have the two petals on the side and then a petal coming up the top. Okay. Right. It's very important that I just interrupt you for a second to explain to our listeners that Allie, like us, is a gestural person. And when Allie said two petals off to the side, she kind of pinched her cheeks as though that's where the petals come. And then the third one on top was on her forehead. (laughs) Or she is the flower. I am a flower. (laughs) Obviously. Yeah. Anyway, so the two uh, petals on the side and the, uh, the one on the top. And it is very important that that one is at the top. So this is the uh, larger petal. It is the medial petal. It is enlarged. It's called a labellum, partially because it's tongue-shaped. So when the leaf starts out, it's at the top. As the leaf develops, it rotates. And the medial uh, petal, the labellum, ends up at the bottom of the flower. So it can serve as a platform for pollinators. 
That's like a like the red carpet. Yeah. Yes. Precisely. Like a landing. Like yes. a helipad. Oh yeah. That's, that's <laughs> oh, okay. yeah. It's the docking bay. So that pedal is called the the labellum, and the whole process of moving the pedal from the top to the bottom of the flower is called resupination. And I've got a full disclosure in my notes. I wrote in this part: orchids are snails. Because of torsion, <laughs> uh, which is an entirely different topic. Sure. <laughs> but that's the first thing it made me think of. Yeah, so that twisting is really important. I, and I love that. That's It's like the plant's version of flounders. Yes! They're like, yes, I want this petal on the bottom. But no, I'm not going to start growing it that way. I'm going to start it on top, and then I'll flip it around. Just yeah. like as a flounder goes, no, I'm not going to be born flat, you idiots. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to move my face to the other side of my body, and then I'll get flat. Yeah. I'll, I'll move be... my eye across my face when it's time. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Why yeah. are you in such a rush? <laughs> so the orchids have a whole lot of variation. Like the, the, broad is, the, the broad strokes is that they have an enlarged medial petal, typically on the bottom, and they tend to have petals, uh, sepals, and groups of three, and they're bilaterally symmetrical. Broad strokes, that is an orchid flower. Obviously, they vary, variated. <laughs> there are many variations on this theme. <laughs> so because they have so many ridiculous shapes of flowers, they have many different pollinators, right? Which this makes a whole lot of sense. Like they have highly specialized pollination systems. So basically because they have really complicated flowers and they tend to often have very small ranges, small populations, they don't often get pollinated. So they tend to persist for a really long time. If you've ever owned an orchid, you know that the flowers of an orchid last for a really long time, much longer than a lot of other flowers. They tend to have their pollen grains in a packet called a pollinarium, um, basically so that the pollinator can take the gift with them. And they will sometimes mimic the appearance uh, and scent of bees or wasps so that the would-be mates or attackers will come pollinate their flowers. Nice. Right? Butterflies and moths like uh, orchids that resemble flowers that they normally feed on or that have a nice helipad for them. Moth-pollinated orchids like the really strong uh, scents at nighttime. The water spider orchid is North America's only aquatic orchid uh, sometimes it forms floating mats and ponds where its green flowers reflect moonlight and emit fragrance to attract uh, moths. Wow, that's like a fairy tale yeah. mythical plant. Yeah, this is something you have to find in Harvest in Skyrim. Yes, right. <laughs> yes, yes. So in higher elevation cloud forests, you tend to have fewer pollinators. And so some orchids have evolved to have brightly colored tubular flowers with large nectar rewards to entice hummingbirds. Thanks. Nice. Right? And unsurprisingly, it's really hard for orchids to get pollinated. So some primarily and some even totally rely on self-pollination. So this is more common in cooler regions with fewer pollinators. Some just reproduce vegetatively and don't even worry about pollination at all. Skip the middleman. Yeah, yeah. I'm just going to make my own babies. <laughs> I, don't, I don't need anybody else. And then finally, I need to talk about the seeds because I mentioned that they are itty bitty and it's one of the weirdest things about orchids. And I feel like that's really saying a lot. So the fruits are dehiscent capsules. So a capsule is basically what it sounds like. It's a really small, smooth, hard fruit. So it's not a fleshy fruit. It's a hard, hard fruit. Dehiscent means that it has openings in it. It will split in predictable places. They tend to have three to six, uh, three or six slits. They are microscopic. In some species, there are over a million seeds per capsule. Wow. Right? How, how does that even become a plant? Isn't that basically just pollen? <laughs> oh, you, you're getting close. Like you're get, you're so much closer than you think you are, Will. Okay, so this unsurprisingly, the, the, the seeds are wind dispersed. Mm -hmm. All right. The weirdest thing. I talked to my dad about this and it blew his mind. My dad is a high school biology teacher and he had never heard of this before. Okay. Most orchids lack an endosperm in their seed. The endosperm is the food for the baby plant. They are too small to fit an endosperm. 
So the way that they feed the baby plant is with a symbiotic relationship with mycorrhizal uh, basidomycetes fungi. They cannot germinate without a fungus. Huh. This reminds me of a couple episodes ago, we answered a patron question and we talked about fairy flies. Yes. About how their eggs, if I remember right, it was that their eggs don't have yolk. Mm -hmm. That they don't have enough food in the egg because the eggs are too small. Mm -hmm. So they rely on outside sources. This is the plant version of that. Yes. So at a lot of places I saw um, them referred to as mycoheterotrophs. Cool. That's so weird. Neat. Right? So not every um, orchid does this. Most do. So species in the genus Disa do not rely on fungi because they're dispersed by water. And that would make it more difficult. So they have slightly larger seeds. Another cool thing I saw about the seeds of orchids was there was a recent study. It came out in 2020 that showed that some orchid seeds could be eaten and defecated by crickets and it produced viable seeds because they were indehiscent, so they didn't have these slits. And so the process of being eaten by crickets wore off the outside so they were able to germinate. I love it because like we've talked about, you know, seed dispersal in herbivores bunches of times but usually we're talking about things bigger than crickets right. <laughs> <laughs> that's so neat this also made me think i i've heard uh my grandfather used to dabble in in botany greenhouse growing and everything and he kept orchids but i feel like i remember my dad saying that they were really temperamental mm-hmm. to like raise and to breed to to yes you know cultivate is it because of the itty bitty seeds and the not likely to be pollinated stuff is that part of it well yeah so you can't really grow orchids from seed for that reason right because you need to have the correct soil microbes in order to do that you can't just be like here you go little seed like that is not that's not gonna work yeah in this soil i got from home depot it's not (laughs) no 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 that's definitely not gonna work yeah, that's that's a big that's a big part of it. So like you can't really grow them from seed. But yeah, they are really sensitive to um it's not precipitation, humidity. That's the word I'm looking for. They're really sensitive to soil moisture and that sort of stuff. And I do wonder how much of that has to do because like they have this relationship with microbes. And what do the microbes want? Yes, yeah. Right. <laughs> Is your roommate happy? <laughs> yes, exactly. What a weird bunch of plants. Mhm. Cool. So where do orchids fit taxonomically uh, among the grand family tree, so to speak, of plants? Where are orchids? Okay, so I'm going to start with the biggest group and work my way down. So orchids, broadly speaking, are angiosperms. So they're flowering plants. Episode 57. Oh, because of all the flowers that they have. I know, right? Yep, exactly. So within flowering plants, they are monocots. So I've, I've... thrown this word around a couple of times there are broadly speaking monocots and dicots dicots not a real group it literally just means not a monocot monocots a real group though so monocot means there is a single cotyledon so the there is a single baby leaf inside of the seed they lack secondary growth growth which means they're not going to turn into true trees and yes this is my definition. I I am team monocots cannot be trees. <laughs> All right. Uh, more on that in episode 73. <laughs> this is true. Uh, and they tend to have oblong or linear leaves with par- parallel venation and their flower parts are divisible by three. So three, six, nine, whatever parts. Within that, so going smaller, they are in the order Asparagales. That's a name for asparagus. <laughs> All right. I love it. Right, right. So Asparagales is the order. This group is really hard to pin down morphologically. It is constrained by uh, genetics. But generally speaking, the leaves tend to form a tight rosette. Uh, The flowers are a lily type. So they look, they're kind of complicated in that way. Uh, And they tend to have six 
tepals, so undifferentiated sepals and petals, and up to six stamens, broadly speaking. So asparagales includes economically important groups such as onions, garlic, leeks, asparagus, uh, vanilla. Tasty group. Oh, yeah. <laughs> vanilla, saffron, aloe, lily of the valley, etc. There's a lot of cool stuff in asparagales. Cool. Then we get down to the family Orchidaceae. Orchidaceae has five subfamilies. Epostasioide, uh, which is the most basal subfamily. Some people argue, argue that these are not true orchids, but molecular research shows that these are just the most basal subfamily in Orchidaceae. The Vanilloidea, which has vanilla in it, there's 15 genera, about 180 species. This is a pan-tropical distribution, Asia, Australia, the Americas. Cyperpedioidea has six genera with about 115 species. Uh, these are mostly either terrestrial or lithophytes. Epidendroidea is the largest subfamily with more than 10,000 species in about 90 to 100 genera. Uh, most are tropical epiphytes. Some are terrestrial or truly micro heterotrophs. And then the last fam subfamily is the Orchidoidea, and that's just a bunch of terrestrial orchids. All right. There are approximately 30,000 species in about 763 genera. For context, the number of orchid species is nearly equal to the number of bony fishes. It is more than twice the number of bird species and is about four times the number of mammal species. That's a lot of plants. And top of that, Orchidaceae encompasses between 6 and 11% of all seed plants <laughs> wow well they their seeds don't take up a lot of space so they can really they fill out more. some area yeah, yeah. They, <laughs> right? more efficient. right this is a big group they don't mess around so orchids have a cosmopolitan distribution meaning that they are found on every continent except for in antarctica and they're found in nearly every type of environment they're everywhere they have the richest diversity in the tropics, but are also found as far north as above the Arctic Circle and as far south as southern Patagonia. Wow. So tying tying our episodes together, would you say that it's hard to find a biome without orchids in it? Yes. Cool. All uh, biomes have orchids. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you're kind of not wrong. So like... <laughs> Most uh, most orchids are perennial epiphytes, which means that they are epiphytes. They're living on top of another plant, and they are perennial, meaning they're going to live for more than a year. There are others that are, again, terrestrial, or they are lithophytes living directly on rock. So terrestrial orchids, the ones that live in the ground, are found in an abundance of climates and habitats, such as forest floors, bogs, semi-arid deserts, savannas, sandy dunes because they have mycorrhiza because they have this relationship with fungi this allows them to get additional nutrition and expand the reach of their root systems so they can live in a whole lot more places uh north america alone is home to over 200 species of orchids but more than a half of them are endangered or threatened hmm Wow. That actually makes a lot of sense because, so orchids are definitely specialists, not generalists. Uh, you know, when we were talking about the shape of their flower, the types of pollination that they have, they tend to be endemic. That you tend to have a species lives in one place, has a, has a restricted range. And that's part of the reason why you have so many species. You go a stone's throw away and that's a different kind of orchid. Right. That's that's an interesting uh, way to to achieve widespreadness and and diversity is instead of being just you can throw an orchid anywhere and it'll be fine. It, they specialize mm -hmm. into every little niche every five feet. Yes. So interesting. Do you have a favorite orchid? I do love vanilla for the Fair obvious choice. reason. Right. Agreed. <laughs> 
my mom raised orchids when I was a kid. And so she had a lot of Phalaenopsis. So that's another one of my favorites. Uh, Lady Slipper is also very pretty. I like those. When I, I was telling a friend of mine that I was <laughs> going to be talking about orchids and he replied, DMX raised orchids. <laughs> All right. There you go. There's a celebrity factor. <laughs> right? <laughs> There are so many types of orchids. I'm actually really surprised I've never actually grown my own, given that I've been to so many, like, Kroger. I've been to so many grocery stores with, like, random orchids in there. I don't know why I've never picked one up. Probably because I think they're scary and hard to keep alive. And after doing this, I think that's still true. That's what I've always heard. Like, from the people I know that, like, my, my in my family that grow plants, that's what they've all said. Well, I'm sure we have a bunch of listeners who have experience with orchids. Yes. Uh, probably the people who requested this episode are people who are already fans of orchids. <laughs> this Venn diagram is a circle. Yes. <laughs> so let's get uh, into our main podcast theme of paleontology a little bit, moving from the modern to the past. Do we know where orchids came from? What the origins of orchids are like? <sighs> Please explain it to us uh, very simply and straightforwardly, as we're sure that you can. Don't worry. It's like this much on my, uh, <laughs> on oh, my yeah. outline. <laughs> okay, it's one of those origin yeah. stories. Yes. As, I say, as, as yes. long as it's a definitive answer, we'll be happy with it. <laughs> oh, no. Okay. This, is, this is more on the turtle origin side <laughs> yeah. than the whale origin side. Yes. In once, that it's a, it's a big old shrug. Once there weren't or- orchids, <laughs> <laughs> and then there were. These are snakes, not not uh, crocodilians. Right. Episodes <laughs> 60, 41, and 3, everybody. <laughs> and 2. Oh, see, now I want to know which plants are crocodilians. <laughs> Audrey, too. <laughs> Palms. Palms. All right. Anyway, that's not uh, neither here nor there. Okay. So, when is really hard to say. Okay. So, um, genetic sequencing. So, molecular clock sort of stuff. Estimates. Estimates that they arose between 76 to like 112 <laughs> million years ago. So sometime in the Cretaceous. Yes. <laughs> we're pretty we're pretty confident that they arose in the Cretaceous, which does make sense given that that's really when the expansion of angiosperms happened. So like, right. okay, cool. I'm on board with this. <laughs> the where is also hard to say, but this is interesting. Okay. So there was, I'll talk about, you know, a little bit, their fossil record, but I was trying to figure out, like, where do we think they came from? You know, I know we don't know a whole lot, but where do we think they came from? And so a study from 2016, Give Nish et al., suggests that orchids appear to have arisen in Australia about 112 million years ago. So All right. they started in Australia and then went into... Um, Antarctica and then use Antarctica to get into South America. So that happened around 90 million years ago when everybody was in close contact. So the Aposteoides, uh, so that's the oldest subfamily, they split off not long, not long after everybody got into South America. And then everybody else seems to have originated in South America around 84 to 64 million years ago. So either at the in the Cretaceous or at the very beginning of the Paleocene. So uh, and this I saw in multiple places that across orchid history, Southeast Asia was a very important place for diversification. Like, there are so many orchids in Southeast Asia and then also in South America. Like, these two places have had just a diversification explosion of orchids through time. Gotcha. So it sounds like they started out in the South, spread across the South, found two home bases on either side of the world, and then took over the planet. Yes. That's a tactical alien invasion. Yes. I'm just thinking about how in risk, like you hunker down yeah. in Australia and you go out from there. Oh man. Right. Don't play plants in risk. That's why. <laughs> <laughs> Do we have much of a sense of what the earliest orchids looked like? Uh, is it like 
pollen evidence or seed evidence where we don't have a lot or do we have some nice fossils from back then we have fossils and I, I, i'll talk about those but it's not you don't get like here's an orchid like it's a little bit more right. detective work All right. <laughs> so the, like you said the information you're sharing is de- genetic work estimating back through history oh yes not a lot from actual fossil evidence saying this is what the first orchids were like yeah and we we do have some fossil evidence and i'll talk about that uh, a little bit more later on but yeah like Mm -hmm. all of our understanding about when they originated and where they originated is entirely based on genetics because like they live everywhere you'd think one of the places they lived they'd get preserved (laughs) They're hard. They're hard to keep around. <laughs> that's that. That's very yeah. true. That's very true. B- both living and dead. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Accurate. <laughs> well, you said that there is a fossil record. There is fossil evidence. So why don't we get into talking about the fossil record of orchids? After this short break, we'll talk orchids through time. tell us about the fossil record of orchids okay so i have a quote from a paper that i i think really encompasses what i'm about to tell you okay as stated by uh schmid and schmid 1973 and 1977 the only direct way of obtaining information on the history of a group of organisms is to study fossils After comprehensive reviews of fossils attributed to Orchidaceae, they concluded that the family has no definite or useful fossil record and that researchers would have to resort to indirect lines of evidence such as phytogeography and structural traits for the reconstruction of the phylogeny of the family. That's such a a clinical way to be like, officially, we have dubbed the fossil record of orchids to be complete trash. It's it definitely (laughs) sounds like it was written by people who are angry at orchids for not having a better fossil record. (laughs) Yes, that's a very passive aggressive. Dang. Right. So that was from the paper in 1977. So the the quote is referring. I took it from a paper from 2017, but it's referring to a quote from 1977. Has it gotten better in the 40 plus yes. years since? Okay, good. <laughs> like immediately. <laughs> the orchids were listening. Yeah, they're like, yes. geez, okay. okay fine. Right, fine. I like to imagine that actually what happened is a bunch of other paleobotanists read it and went, that's not true. Here's all the places with orchid fossils. <laughs> so the first. Maybe we should tell people about these. <laughs> oh, think people would be interested in that? Uh, okay, so the first orchid fossil to be found after the paper from 1977 was found uh, was published excuse me in 1984 so it's called eo orchis the dawn orchid which is such a good name Ooh. eo orchis is just the, the primordial version of the <laughs> deity from yes, yes. D and D, the demon lord well it's it's before his fall when he was all in the flowers and <laughs> Eo Orcus was very fey. Yeah, he yes. just grew flowers and I'm so, sang. I'm so into this. Okay, so it's <laughs> Eo Orcus uh, Myocanica because it's from the Miocene, unsurprisingly. So it was found in South Germany and it is a five millimeter carbonized flower. However, further um, study of this fossil, it's not definitively Orchidaceae. The traits that it has could be indicative of other monocot families. So like Zingerberaceae, which is the ginger family. Okay, so like, all right, that one's a bust. The next one is from 2007. So they they waited a bit. (laughs) Yeah. And again, this is one where like not everyone is like people are on board with it, but it's it's one of those things that like, really, this is our this this is it. It's called Mealy Orcus Caribbea, which is fantastic. The reason some people are like, really? Not that there's anything wrong with it, but like, this is what we're stuck with. It's because it's a pollinarium. It is a packet of pollen attached to a stingless bee 
in Dominican amber. Gotcha. A lot of these are going to be from amber. Makes sense. Uh, right? It does make perfect sense. And actually, a lot of them are pollen in amber, but they're attached to their pollinators, which is actually really cool. That's yeah. actually, that's really neat. Yeah. Yeah. When you can't find the, fl- I mean, well, it, it is a little bit like what that quote was saying. We have to go with indirect evidence. Yeah, when you can't actually find the plant, but you have a decent amber fossil record, episode yep. 62, of animals yes. with pollen on them, that's an avenue to study these plants. Exactly. So there have been, since then, there have been multiple, I think there were four or five different species that were de- uh, described a lot from uh, Dominican and Mexican amber. So this is all early Miocene, like 15 to 20 mi- million years old. So sometimes it's just the amber, but oftentimes it's associated with insects like weevils or beetles. Again, this is really cool because, hey, you're not getting the flower th- itself, but you're getting this plant and pollinator interaction, which is still, it's telling you even more. Yeah. than you would necessarily just get from the flower. So going back a little bit earlier in time, so this is from 2009, there are leaves from a diatomite, a rock that's made out of diatoms, um, from New Zealand. It's about 20 to 23 million years old. And these are compressed leaf macrofossils. This is the first record of not pollen. <laughs> <laughs> Wow. Right? So they're Eorina, Fuldensis, and Dendrobium phylum. So Dendrobium is actually, I think they both are. Yeah, both genera are actually extant genera. Okay. So the reason that they are conferable, so identifiable to extant genera, is because they could, they were able to look at the um, arrangement and placement of stomata on the leaves. Wow. So they could link them with the living, uh, each a living genus yep. of this plant by looking at the microscopic pores yes. in the leaf. That's very cool. That's really cool. Wow. So not just like we found some leaves, we found some really exceptionally well-preserved leaves. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> leaves that we were able to fingerprint. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And then the oldest, the oldest identifiable orchid fossil which is also the most recently identified orchid fossil from 2017 it's from baltic amber unsurprisingly so this is from the eocene so earlier and this is an a pollinarium and an anther so one of the parts of the flower that is attached to the hind leg of a fungus gnat I learned that there's such thing as a fungus gnat now. <laughs> I don't really know what a fungus gnat is, but I can only assume that it hangs around fungus, which makes a whole lot of sense given what I know about orchids. <laughs> right? But I, I also, one of the things I like about this, it's like, okay, you want pollen? I'll give you pollen. You want plant pollinator interaction? I'll give you plant pollinator interaction. You want a plant part? You want a flower part? I'll give you that too. Like the fact that you got all of them and it's the oldest uh, known fossil. Like, I like that. That yeah. is very cool. This fungus gnat grabbed some pollen, grabbed an anther, and then just headed straight into some sap. Yep. And and someone's going to need this. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. For the greater good. <laughs> My people need me and I must go. <laughs> but that, that's it. I basically told you every fossil we know of orchids. Yeah, I was going to say, I did ask you to tell us about the orchid fossil record, and I can't help but notice that you listed, like, four examples. There were, hold on, there's, like, one, <laughs> two, three, four, I think there's five, six, seven, eight, nine, nine. Wow. Yeah. And one of those is disputed, so, like, eight. So, like, eight. Eight so and the, a half. So, the answer to tell us about the orchid fossil record is no. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Listen, if you didn't want to, <laughs> we could have just done another topic. That's, that's partially why when you're like, Allie, tell me what the fossil record is like. I'm like, I can't because then right. I'll give you the entire section. <laughs> Boy, I sure would like to. Well, that that's a really interesting. And we've we've done episodes where we've touched on this kind of topic where there are groups of life 
that are represented and fairly well understood today that we just have basically no fossil evidence i think the last episode we had the news about tardigrades Mm. and how there was a new discovery of a tardigrade in amber that is the third known fossil tardigrade oh my it's like yeah there are some groups that just have such little uh, evidence in the fossil record if you had asked me i wouldn't have expected that one of those groups is one of the most diverse and widespread modern groups of plants. Exactly. Like that's the thing that really sticks out. And, and you know, it kind of harkens back to what we like to touch on with the fossil record and what we have now are not always, we can, they're not always the same and they may not always read the same mm-hmm. just because it's diverse. Now doesn't mean we have a diverse uh, record of them. Yeah. Really successful group. Just don't want to be remembered. <laughs> yes yes yeah basically it's that was the thing like i i had to work so hard to find anything about the origins about the fossil record (laughs) like there's just very little there like it the record is primarily from amber and our understanding of their biogeography and like uh evolutionary history is molecular Yeah, yeah. Well, we sure appreciate you doing all this looking (laughs) for us. All right. So, well, okay. let me ask you this, then. If we don't have much fossil evidence, you talked about how we know the origins, uh, mostly based on DNA evidence. Has genetic study told us more about orchid evolution and sort of evolutionary history and trends? Oh, yes. Oh, yes, 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 yes. Oh, okay. okay. Tell tell us about that. (laughs) All right. So the genetics of orchids is a fascinating rabbit hole. So one of the cool things is, as I mentioned at the very beginning, orchids are cam plants. Right, the weird photosynthesizers. Yeah, which means that the fact that they have been genetically sequenced, orchids were the first cam plant to be genetically sequenced, which you know broadens our understanding of what it even means to be a plant, because this is an entirely different type of photosynthesis. So... I make this joke constantly in person. I'm sure I've made it on the podcast that plants are just like, I'm going to duplicate my genome. Right. Like, that's a thing they do. What if all of my DNA, but again. Yes. Yes. I don't want to be like you, mom and dad. I'm going to duplicate my genome. (laughs) That's basically what's going on with plants. But orchids had basically... Okay. So orchids underwent a whole genome duplication event before the KPG. So sometime in the Cretaceous, they doubled the size of their genome. Uh, They actually, it was unclear. It said the ancestral, ancestral orchid added one further set of genes, which makes it sound like there are three. Hmm. So... Regardless, they duplicate, like, they added more. They had a gene explosion in the Cretaceous. Yes. That just rapidly expanded the size of their genome. Yes. And that (laughs) ended up being really useful to them. So because they had so much genetic material to choose from, they were able to rapidly diverge and evolve into these five subfamilies. And right, adapt. That makes sense. Yeah. Like, that's why we find them in on every comp- continent in every environment. It's because, like, I got all these genes, you know? Yeah. Well, they've just got a whole extra couple backpacks full of tools yeah. that they can modify and adjust and select for different purposes. Yeah. Exactly. And, like, I'll, it that do that, a lot of these traits that make orchids orchids do go back to that uh, duplication event. Like, because of that, it gave them this flexibility. So, like, the labellum and the gynostemium, so that's the, the, the fused uh, flower parts, the fused stamen and pistil, those are regulated by these Mads box genes that regulate uh, flower development. So, the genes that allowed them to make their fancy flowers were there from the beginning of orchids like that is a very deeply ancestral trait after the the genome duplication event 
that's when they have, that's where you get the genes that allow them to really differentiate the labellum, so that fancy medial leaf. That's also where the medially symmetrical flower structure comes in. And the, uh, the importance of the medially, or excuse me, the bilaterally symmet symmetrical flower, that allows them to self-pollinate, like, really easily, because it allows uh, the pollen to basically fall back into the flower, because it's got sides and it's got a front because of the labellum. Uh, so it makes it a lot easier for the plant to self-pollinate. Wow. So it sounds like early on, orchid evolution went, here are the handful of things that make an orchid an orchid. Mm -hmm. Way up front. Yeah. Take a couple extra sets of genes, go forth and diversify. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, precisely. And like even the um, the loss of the endosperm in their seeds, that happened really early on. So making these super tiny seeds that like, I'm really going to go out there. Like I'm going to, I'm going to have like all of the, th the world is my oyster. The world is my orchid. I can thank go, you. Thank yep. you. <laughs> <laughs> I can go anywhere. <laughs> So they, they were very orchidy very early on. Yeah, orchids have been orchids basically since they've been orchids. Which would make me suspect that it, if we found fossil orchids, they would be very recognizable. Yeah. But we don't. Yeah. yeah. Yes. <laughs> yes, we don't find any. But if we did, they would look how we expected. Right. Uh, <laughs> so, you know. Then what's, you know, what's the point? Right, we already know what they look yeah. like. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> but yeah, so being able to have all of these seeds, that puts their seeds into all sorts of different environments. They're really good at adapting to a different environment. So you just have orchids everywhere. Very cool. This is another trend that ha that shows up over the course. And we've talked about this with mostly with animals, because that's a lot of what we talk about when Allie's not around, <laughs> of how you have these early radiations of a group that gets a bunch of unique properties, unique traits, and then just takes over from there. And there are a lot of groups today that are really widespread and successful that got that way early on and then just kept on going. Well, the thing that I find fascinating, and maybe this could be the difference between um, plants and animals, I'm not sure, because in animal contexts, when you're talking about who's more likely to do well after a mass extinction, it's generalists. Right. That if you, if you have specific requirements for your food, your space, your resources, you're more likely to lose those requirements than if you can survive on a variety of things. Exactly. Statistically, you're more likely to be out of luck uh, versus right. if you can just do anything. But orchids are very much not generalists. But they're so specialized to be specialists that they are kind of generalists. Well, it, it makes it seem like there's an orchid everywhere. So if you lose 95% of your <laughs> habitable environments... You still have orchids because there were orchids adapted for those leftover places. Exactly. Yeah. You know, we, we often, uh, you, you'll hear generalists described as adaptable because they can, they, they can make do with and then therefore start to adapt in many, many situations. While here it sounds more like they're adaptable in the fact that they adapt to multiple situations really easily or really well. Yeah. Which is, which is so interesting. That's a really interesting trend. And I, you know, who knows? I don't know if this is a, a plant versus animal thing, because again, like normally when people talk about mass extinctions, they're talking about animals. Uh, what? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, that was something that I was thinking about. Like, you know, I guess it also depends on like the level that you're talking about being a specialist versus a generalist, because at like the species or like the genus level, they might be super specialized. But if you get to the at the family level, they're so generalized. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, we know that orchids are very diverse. I'm sure there has been a lot of research on orchids. I'm going to lead into this last section of our episode just by saying, Allie, what else is interesting and cool about orchids? <laughs> oh, my goodness gracious. Everything. Oh, my goodness gracious. Okay. Tell us some of the things. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I have just lots of very, like, small bullet notes, so I'll get through what I can. Okay. So. 
just this this is going to be a charcuterie board of orchid facts an orcuterie board <laughs> oh no a, a s'more kids board i actually love that and that makes me i'll keep workshopping it. okay i i'm sad how much i enjoy that need a sky trap <laughs> okay so orchids they are actually very useful to humans um, so you might like when you think of orchids, you probably think of their beauty. People like to grow orchids, and that's very true. Like orchid cultivation is a massive industry. Like there is there is so much, and there's so much crossbreeding and fancy things. Like I have been to two or three different orchid shows in my life. Wow! <laughs> right, like. <laughs> That's a thing that people do. So I'm, I'm not really going to go into that as much because that is something that people are broadly familiar with. But orchids have a lot, other, a lot of other different uses for us too. They are actually really common in perfumery. Because, huh. okay. you know, some, a lot of them smell really nice. I was going to say, the orchid that is foremost in my brain during now during this episode is vanilla. Yes. Yep. Which is a nice smelling flower. Yeah. Sure do smell good. Exactly. And so it is commonly used in, in uh, perfumery. Perfumery. On the other hand, I went on a bit of a rabbit hole of orchid smell facts. So depending on who the pollinator is affects how it smells. So the ones that attract flies and beetles smell like carrion or dead fish. So just Makes sense. imagine this beautiful, beautiful flower that smells like a dead fish. That's awesome. That's a good gag gift. Right? (laughs) There are also, this one I think is super fascinating. So there are orchids that to humans have no smell, but it's just to humans because they actually are mimicking the pheromones of insects to trick the insect into mating with the flower. Huh. Cool. Yeah. Catfish orchids. Yes! (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, so kind of moving on, uh, David brought up vanilla. So if you think about cooking, obviously vanilla. Like, there was a whole lot of, like, colonialism that went around with, like, y'all, we gotta get vanilla. (laughs) And if you have ever actually seen a uh, vanilla pod, all of those itty-bitty seeds in there... (laughs) You already knew that orchids had teeny tiny seeds. If you've ever eaten... Um, vanilla bean ice cream. Vanilla bean ice cream. You've seen the little vanilla seeds. I thought it was ground up. No, that's how small they are. Damn, man, I'm going to be so like stuck in my own head when I eat vanilla ice cream next time. Just, Just every time. swallowing like, hundreds There we go. Another plants. generation's worth. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. So vanilla, a lot of them are from uh, vanilla planifolia. But yeah, vanilla, like vanilla is very fancy. Mm -hmm. The fact that it's got this reputation like, oh, it's vanilla. It's boring. No, 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 no. Like, I really highly recommend going into and like looking at the history of the cultivation of vanilla because it's a trip. See, this is why it's the best flavor. Fact. Hard agree. Like, yes. Sure. (laughs) Sure. (laughs) So on on that note, vanilla is not the only orchid that's used in cooking. So the tubers, so basically like tomato, tomato. So tubers, uh, basically potato uh, sort of structures of some terrestrial orchids like Orchis uh, mascula can be ground into a powder used for cooking so it can be used to make hot beverages so it's basically like the hot chocolate mix or used to make a type of ice cream so this is common in iran and turkey and unfortunately the wild orchids are going uh, locally extinct because they are being used for uh tasty uh desserts in uh, on reunion island the dried leaves of Jamelia fragrance, another type of orchid, uh, is actually used to flavor rum. Hmm. Yeah. Who knew? And then in Australia, uh, indigenous people have been cultivating the tubers of saprophytic orchids in the genus Gastrodia to eat, which is really cool. Like, you think about orchids, you think about the pretty flowers, like, nah, they're basically, they're making potatoes. It's fine. (laughs) (laughs) 
I guess that makes sense that if you have a plant that has found a million different ways to live, that we humans would then find a million different ways to use the orchids for our own purposes. Oh yeah, just just statistically, when you're that diverse, some of you are going to be tasty. Oh yeah. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> well, and it's really interesting because, again, when I was going down this rabbit hole, I kept finding... Like the the number of countries whose national flower is some type of orchid, like Belize, Colombia, Costa Rica, Guatemala, Honduras, Panama, Singapore, and Venezuela. So South America in particular, <laughs> South yeah. and uh, Central America. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which makes perfect sense given that that is like a center of diversity today. It's also the city flower of uh, Shaoxing, China. And it is the state flower of the Indian state of Assam. Cool. So in addition to all of their other claims to fame, orchids are also just extremely popular with humans. Yes. And that's the next thing I wanted to talk about was that orchids are very common in ancient art from Greece and China, which again, it makes perfect sense. They're, they're common there and they're really pretty. Um, the oldest record of art uh, uh, artistic depictions of orchids is from the Arapasis uh, relief in Rome. It was dedicated in 9 BC to Pax, the goddess of peace. And it, yeah, it is the earliest representation of orchids in ancient art broadly and European art specifically. Wow. So they have the gall not to have a fossil record, but they'll be in the archaeological <laughs> record. Right? <laughs> biased plants <laughs> exactly but yeah so i could have gone into a lot more detail but broadly speaking humans love orchids so have often when i think about humans love this specific kind of thing it ends up with humans then spreading that thing all over the world like we see with dogs and cats and chickens and horses but it sounds like orchids are already spread all over the world yeah so in general i didn't really see I didn't really see anything with like, you know, introduced orchids because one, there are orchids everywhere already. And two, orchids are delicate little babies. Mm -hmm. right. <laughs> and like, I genuinely don't know how well they, they're very specialized. I don't know how well they would adapt if you brought a European orchid into North America. I was like, good luck. In general, the, the like the human distribution like we when we take orchids places it's because we want them in our houses yeah yeah that, so it's like we we have spread them globally but they haven't become invasive in right. the same way so more like dogs than cats yeah yes <laughs> okay technically they live everywhere but mostly inside houses yeah yes 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 well, this has been really interesting. We we over the course of this episode discussion i have gone from knowing nothing about orchids to being fascinated by orchids yes Yay, that's what I've wanted. And now what it makes me want to do is go look at pictures of all sorts of different types of orchids. And indeed, uh, we will have a blog post as usual after this episode where people can find links to more stuff about orchids and see some pictures of what orchids look like. Yes. Or at least of, I should say, what some orchids look like. Oh, yes. Right from the start, this was the kind of discussion where I thought, okay, this is this is one of those groups where it's hard to say what a typical orchid looks like because there's just so many of them right like orchids uh, well i mean i described an orchid that never comes above the ground except for sometimes it has to reproduce like there is no typical orchid you described orchids uh, over your description there are orchids that have managed to tried their very hardest to not photosynthesize not pollinate and not take root yeah so as we said they are plants trying extremely hard to not be plants i if only there were carnivorous orchids like then they would truly be plants that are trying to be animals oh who, who knows in the fossil I, record well i was gonna say who knows today <laughs> yeah that's true With Thirty thousand species yeah what are what are what's the odds that there is actually a carnivorous orchid out there we just haven't found it right yet. but I, also like for, for all we know the eocene was the age of the carnivorous orchids and we just <laughs> that's please. true we just don't have them oh, maybe please. all the carnivorous orchids are just millimeters in size <laughs> and they feed on worms and stuff yes oh, yes please like the carnivorous fungi 
Yes, please. <laughs> We're going to find out they're like tardigrades and they're just everywhere. <laughs> 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 yes i love this yeah this was uh because y'all have brought up for a while like hey these are these are pe- things people want you to talk about orchids and i was so it's like i don't know how much there is to talk about orchids y'all yeah. there's so much <laughs> well that's we've long said that's the beauty of the podcast is that it gives us an excuse to dive into topics we otherwise would not have dove into or thought there was much to dive into yeah. in the first place yeah this is amazing. Well, before we wrap up, speaking of things that our listeners want, the last thing we'll do is go to a patron question. One of the things that our patrons get to do on our Patreon at a certain level is submit questions for us to answer on the podcast. And since we have started doing this new tradition of plant episodes for episodes that end in a five, we've been getting questions for Ally about plants, which has been great. Now, I'm actually going to read two different plant-related questions from patron questions. Patron question number one uh, is one we've already answered. This (laughs) is from Alejandro, who asks, There's research showing that plants have very simple nervous systems, and fly traps, of course, use ion channels for response behaviors. Can you speculatively evolve trees that save up energy and occasionally walk around like ants from Lord of the Rings? Good idea. Great idea. We did that. Yes. <laughs> Check out all four episodes of Spooky <laughs> this year uh, for Speculative Evolution in October. We have talked about how to get plants to move. And I should note that uh, Alejandro actually did tweet at us after our trees episode <laughs> for Spooky and say, "This I count this as an answer to my patron question. So <laughs> glad to hear it. Which was the point. <laughs> <laughs> so instead... Here's another patron question for Allie. Daria says, In a previous Allie episode, she mentioned that geologic epochs are often designated based on animal extinctions and that it would be different if it was based on plant extinctions. Allie, could you give us a potential outline of what it might look like if we had a geologic time scale based on plants instead of animals? This would be my absolute pleasure because this has been something that has been in my head for years. <laughs> and this is also a great question to go along with this month's theme of speculative evolution in plants. Yes, all plants all the time. <laughs> so broadly, so I'm only going to answer this broadly because like trying to give absolute specifics would could literally be a podcast into itself. But to begin... There's actually a lot of uh, argument within the paleobotany community whether or not plants have ever uh, experienced a mass extinction. Mm -hmm. Because our understanding of mass extinctions is fundamentally based on not just animals, but often marine animals. And so plants being terrestrial photo autotrophs, you know, they're using light from the sun to make their own energy, are going to have a completely different relationship with climate change and mass extinction. So generally speaking, you're not going to see the same, like, end of an era, end of a, you know, literally an era um, that you see with animals if you were to base it on plants. Because first of all, like, plants weren't really a thing on land, until the Silurian. Like, they weren't really well established. So, like, you don't have to worry about anything that happened before that. Because that wasn't going to impact plants. So, everything before the Silurian is just the same geologic time period. Yes. In terms of plants. <laughs> it, it would be, the you know, the equivalent of the Precambrian today. Like, if you're basing it on, on animals, like, it's the Pre... I don't know. Whatever cute name we come up with. <laughs> but, basically, I see it as four main time periods you have the age of mosses uh which is basically going to be the silurian and the devonian and then you have the age of ferns uh which is the carboniferous into the permian and into the uh, triassic and then the age of gymnosperms which is the jurassic and the beginning of the cretaceous and then the age of angiosperms from the (laughs) cretaceous till today Uh, And then within that, you can break it down. Like the rise of grasslands would definitely be a good time, uh, smaller time bin. But even just the origin of true rainforests 
could also be a good start, uh, a good, another good time bin, things like that. But yeah, broadly speaking, if it, if, if it were up to me, um, I would base it on more the community composition than basically like, when, where do you see this, this big dramatic turnover in terms of who is living here? Because yeah, because it actually does kind of come out pretty nice and ev- evenly. You got the mosses, you got the, the ferns, you got the gymnosperms, you got the flowering plants, like everybody gets their, their chance to be the most diverse. <laughs> So in this sense, it sounds less like it's based on, you know, extinction and stuff like that. This sounds more akin to land mammal ages. Yes. Yes. Where it's this age, this period, this time bin starts with the appearance of this new thing. Yes. And maybe sometimes the disappearance of another thing. Yes. But often when this group shows up, we are now in a new time period. Exactly. So like the Carboniferous rainforest collapse would be, again, that's a that's a good end point, you know, fundamental change. Right, right. Cool. I, well, and I like the way that you put it because it nicely mirrors, because we really like the age of. Yes. The right, age of fishes, the age of reptiles, the age of mammals. Yes. And it's really cool to think about that with plants where I guess it would be like, the age of algae. <laughs> yes. And then the age of mosses. Yes, yes. And the age of, I guess, the age of forests and various yeah. uh, uh, kinds. Yes. Then we can have the fancy name, which is the Dendrozoic. Yep. <laughs> the, the Poesocene. Yes. Yes, exactly. We got, like, we should workshop this. I think we're on to something. <laughs> this is great. Very cool. Well, if anyone out there wants to speculatively make a time scale. Based on plants, uh, where all the different time bins are different shades of green. Yes, please. <laughs> Slap some names on it, send it to us, and we'll see what we think. <laughs> yes, please. Yes, please. Very cool. Well, thank you, Daria, for that question. Thank you also, Alejandro, for your very prescient patron question. <laughs> Thanks to everybody who requested this episode. Thanks to everybody who listens and supports us. And of course, at the end of another five episode... Thanks to Allie for joining us. Yes, this was so much fun. I talked to y'all so much <laughs> like recently. <laughs> this has been great. Yeah. yeah. Luckily, you get a break from us. Right. <laughs> oh, I know. Oh. We're going to let you have a break. Allie, you will be back, of course, for episode 135. Yes. Our episode request list has now a very long list of requests for plant-related episodes. Yes. But listeners, please don't let that discourage you from sending in your request for plant-related episodes. And we'll have Allie back again in a few months. Yeah. In the meantime, if you want to keep up to date with us, you can follow us on social media. If you want to follow Allie, we'll put Allie's uh, tag in the episode description. Check out the blog post for more links and photos and stuff for more information about orchids. We release episodes every fortnight and sometimes extra stuff in between like Spooky. So stay tuned for more stuff. Yeah. Bye, everybody. Bye. Thanks for listening to the Common Descent Podcast. You can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and check our WordPress blog for pictures and links after each episode. Huge thanks to our patrons whose support helps keep this podcast running and who get access to bonus goodies on Patreon. The song you're hearing is called On the Origin of Species by Protodome, which we found at ocremix.org. Thanks again for listening. We hope you'll join us next time.